So over the last few years, there's been increasing interest in the overlap between Freemasonry, Kabbalah, magic, alchemy, and uh, other related areas of esotericism. I'm Angel Miller, author of The Three Stages of Initiatic Spirituality and The Path of the Warrior Mystic. And today I'm speaking with uh, Philippa Lee, editor of The Square magazine and author of The Masonic Magician, The Life and Death of Count Cagliostro and his Egyptian rite, Cagliostro, The Unknown Master, The Zen Revolution Diet, and Secrets of Meditation, among other books. And she's going to be talking about Count Cagliostro and his Egyptian rite of Freemasonry, and uh, we'll be touching on Kabbalah, alchemy, Egyptology, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, Pasquale, and uh, other fascinating and little discussed subjects. Well, with that, I hope you enjoy. So, so you're the author of uh, several books on spirituality, and a couple of those are on uh, Count Cagliostro, uh, the very colorful uh, Masonic magician of the 18th century. So perhaps you could just begin by telling us a little bit about you and a little bit about uh, how you fell into this strange and colorful world of uh, alternative spirituality and alternative Freemasonry. I... Um... Well, basically, I've, I've been interested in um, esotericism and uh, Freemasonry for, for many years. I've been studying it, well, studying esotericism since my teens and um, then gradually got into um, the sort of Masonic circle due to partners and friends. Um, right. And so that kind of you know obviously both of them blend very nicely together depending on your, your um viewpoint of, of freemasonry um and so i was quite intrigued by the connections between um alchemy and the um the, the possible egyptian connection which of course I've, I've now since obviously um, debunked that one, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, the the whole thing with Cagliostro is quite strange actually. Um, I literally came across an article about this strange chap right. who had um, created a, a ritual whereby he came down from the ceiling on a golden globe, absolutely butt naked, um, and I just thought, wow, this is. Well, apart from the fact of being totally bizarre, it's actually you know really fascinating. So, yeah, um, I I kind of mentioned it to a few people, and then I, I, again, I don't know how it happened. Um, Robert Cooper, the uh, the curator at the Grand Lodge of Scotland's uh, Library and Museum, he said, "Oh, we've 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 got a we've got a book here by him." So I pricked up my ears and thought. Yeah. Fantastic. And I said, what is it? And he said, oh, I don't know. Um, it's in French. Um, I think it's a ritual. And I was like, oh, you know, gold dust. So I said, right, okay. Um, you know, can you come and have a look at it? And so my French was pretty appalling. His wasn't much better. But we, we managed to work out that there was obviously something quite intriguing about this ritual and um, we could pick up that it was obviously esoteric um that it had um angelic references alchemical references uh kabbalah so we thought okay we're onto something here um yeah. so we did a bit more research and we actually found that um parts of it had been translated um by henry ridgely evans um, I think that was back in the early 1900s. And so we wanted to actually then um, translate the entire ritual. Right. So we got some translators who were uh, familiar with 
18th century French and also who would probably understand the more sort of academic terms with um, Freemasonry and alchemy. Um, and they did a fantastic job of translating it. So then, of course, we had to weave um, in his backstory. And that was kind of when it became even more interesting when right. we, we into what he was like. Um, you know, he comes over as this incredibly charismatic, very knowledgeable, um, bombastic, colourful character. I mean, obviously, there were many of those characters in um, that era, you know, the Edge of Enlightenment. You, you've got all these other wonderful right, yeah. people out of it. Yeah. Uh, Saint Germain mm -hmm. um, and Martin is the Pasquale, right. uh, you know, that bunch of people. But then, of course, you've also got Mesmer and Mozart mm -hmm. to add to the blend. So these guys all were hanging around together. Um, and so it, it just made for such a brilliant story. And then, of course, the fact that it turned out that he had woven his own or, or you know, reinvented his own sort of history to... Almost like the Christian Rosenkreuz. Sort of, yeah. Um, he came from, you know, sort of a, a very sort of poor background and had been initiated into all these mysteries and everything. So we got these accounts from various things to do with his um, um, connections with the French government. Well, when I say connections, it was actually his run ins with the, <laughs> the French government. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, he he seemed to cause a bit of chaos wherever he went right um and he i mean he he came over to england he he was initiated into freemasonry in london in 1777 and um i think it was at that time that he met um quite a few people who were on the the, the very esoteric um, outskirts of Freemasonry at that point. Um, so he was, he lived very close to where Swedenborg had lived. Oh, really? Okay. London, and yeah. he was, he was um, very good friends with um, Rabbi Falk, who was the clerk called the Balshem of, of London. Um, who was a very knowledgeable Kabbalist. So, you know, all the all these kind of meetings with remarkable men, as Gurdjieff would have classed it, um, yeah. he, they hung out with people like Blake, William Blake, and um, Philip de Lutherberg. So not only had he got this group of people in England, he also had many little subgroups around Europe. He traveled through um, um, Strasbourg, um, Russia, and everywhere he went, like I said, he just caused this little bit of chaos and <laughs> was basically kicked out of all these places. Right. Um, I, I think, I, I kind of, at the beginning, I had that thing where you, you kind of get enamoured with your subject. Right, of course. He, it, what a romantic, flamboyant mm -hmm. character he was. Um, and you kind of get blinded to what is behind a lot of this behaviour. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now I have a very different opinion of him. Um Oh, I still find him absolutely fascinating, but yeah. I think, you know, the rose-tinted specs have come off of it. <laughs> but, um, he, I mean, he did some remarkable stuff. He created this ritual, um, yeah. the Egyptian rite, um, and even set up the, the Mother Lodge in Lyon. Right. I think he was a real kind of, I don't know if you guys over there will get this um, analogy, but he was a Marmite figure. It, in Britain, we have this food stuff called Marmite. Right, yeah. And people either love it or hate it, and it's kind of yeah. turned into this 
<laughs> real kind of you either do or you don't. And he he is a real Marmite character, mm-hmm. and I think he always was. Um, and so he was kind of pitting himself up against a lot of the other very prominent um, esoteric Freemasons at the time, and there was quite a lot of rivalry. And there were some that obviously didn't trust him very much. So, yeah, so basically we, we filled in all the background in the book as much as we could. There's still loads more that were found since wow. and that other people have found out about him since. Um, but the main point was this ritual. Um, and it kind of didn't quite do what it said on the tin because there is nothing Egyptian actually in the right at all right Um, yeah it's yeah it's you know christian um esotericism um it's kabbalah a bit Mm -hmm. of alchemy you know a real kind of melting pot of traditions yeah nothing (laughs) egyptian in there Mm. and um i think you know, that was one of the weirdest things because obviously I've studied Egypt and its um, traditions and religion for for a fair amount of time as well, probably, you know, for the past 30 years. And I've visited Egypt a lot. So once my knowledge of that grew and I, I got beyond the idea that there could be any connection between Freemasonry and Egypt, yeah. it was very easy then to say, well, actually, that there, there is nothing Egyptian here. Right. I very much doubt he, he managed to travel there. Yeah. Um, at that period of time, obviously, the, the hieroglyphs hadn't even been deciphered by Champollion. Right, exactly. So what he was purporting to be Egyptian hieroglyphs yeah, apparently he was, it was meant to have worn cloaks with hieroglyphs on. And there's even um, a piece from one of his um, memoirs that shows some hieroglyphs, and they're just absolutely, <laughs> you know, they're not hieroglyphs. Well, I mean, they're hieroglyphs in the sense that they're weird figures, but they're definitely not Egyptian. <laughs> right. So why was he um, claiming um, that, that it was from Egypt or calling it the Egyptian, right, do you think? I think because at that particular time, um, people were starting to travel to Egypt and uh, some artifacts have been coming back probably from the 1600s onwards. Yeah. There had been travellers that had bought things back like mummies um, and hence the use of things like mummia, which was a supposedly ground up mummies that people took oh wow medicinal thing which i mean is actually really disgusting um (laughs) yeah um and it also came about that the idea of mummy brown paint which again is another sort of thing that has been kind of attributed um i'm certainly not ruling out the fact that some people that had been there or had bought things back or were trading artifacts um you know, hadn't gathered a little bit of the the knowledge that was left. But right. to be very honest with you, I mean, and people don't like to hear this, is that Egypt died a long time ago. And the secrets were... I personally don't think that they were... Well, they were definitely not passed on in their entirety. If right. anything... Yeah. As you know, that people um, cherry pick the bits that they want from traditions. Oh, yeah, very much so. And there's a lot of confirmation bias Yeah. in the esoteric world. Well, mm. I mean, it's in every world, even in history um, and science. But I think even when I go over to Egypt now, I mean, you, you know, you, you're surrounded by all this incredible wisdom that we still actually have not kind of grasped yeah. what 
it means in its entirety. You can kind of piece bits together. There's a lot of conjecture. There's a lot of, I hope this means that. Yeah. I, I've i always felt, and especially since I've um, become a better researcher, that I don't want to give people the idea that there is something there that isn't. And intuition mm-hmm. might be a wonderful thing. And I've had people say to me, oh, but my intuition tells me. I said, well, you know, well, <laughs> That doesn't make it real. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um, So I I think it was it was becoming very interesting to everybody at that point. Egyptomania was is in its infancy, and of course, it then went massively. Yeah. When Napoleon went over, right, um, and did his big expedition. Yeah. um, And he brought back so much stuff and then of course you've also got people um who started to go over like um balzoni and all the the english aristocrats who started excavating but you know that's slightly beside the point but from Cagliostro's point of view i'm sure egypt was already a very interesting and mystical place for him to yeah. want to be associated with you know we all yeah. love it I don't know anybody really that hasn't been touched by, you know, just how incredible Egypt is. I don't know yeah. if you saw the um, opening of the Sphinx Avenue. I did not. No. Oh my God! It was they. They actually did a reenactment of, um, or an artistic reenactment of the Opet Festival, um, which is very very ancient, and so you can just see how much of an effect it's still has on us even now yeah um but you pick apart the ritual it you there is nothing in there that Mm. you could say was um attributed to egypt really right right yeah and um if we go uh later in time egypt also had a massive effect on or egyptology had a massive effect on of course, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and Austin Osman's spare. And he actually did spend some time in Egypt during World War One, I, I believe. But, but um, it was, was the Egyptian right really the first to kind of at least claim to have some kind of Egyptian origin? Um, I think it was probably the, the, the first um, widespread... Um, depiction of it or yeah you know. um I, obviously you know going back to the hermetica yeah um right. and that being translated um yeah. gosh, when was that 60 no oh, God, i can't remember um but it, it was translated by i think it was facino right. and that obviously purported to be um, the teachings of Thoth. Yeah. By a Hermes Trismegistus. Yeah. Um, again, you've got this syncretic blend of traditions um, because, it, I mean, effectively, I think it's been officially dated to around about the first, second century AD. Right. Which, yeah. You know, you know, everyone gathered in Alexandria. Um, because it was, you know, the cradle of learning. And um, they were all bringing in their own traditions and religions. So, of course, everything got kind of mixed up and mixed in. And by that mm-hmm. point, Egypt was Christianized. Right, yeah. Um, and Copts, I would say the Copts are actually the the legacy of ancient Egypt. Yeah. Um, I have Coptic friends and having been to um, the churches and various other sacred places in Egypt, it is absolutely evident that ancient Egypt exists within the Coptic uh, church. Yeah. I mean, they still use the same uh, calendar, the Uh ancient Egyptian calendar. The words included in the Coptic, liturgy and uh, you now i'm gonna sound woo woo you can feel it, it it's, <laughs> um, it's definitely there um but 
obviously they had renounced the, yeah. the Egyptian gods by that point. Right. Although I think there was definitely some very deep respect. Mm. Um, so, yes, we've got this this huge blend of things. And, and with, with the Hermetic Order, the Golden Dawn and the other Hermetic Orders, is that they've they've taken bits from egypt that's right um, yeah in yeah. my opinion you know i mean obviously everyone's got their own opinion and it doesn't you know matter if that is exactly how you you know if you want to feel that it is directly from egypt then that's fine but you, you i don't think you can actually turn around and say yes it is you know with certainty mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just, no not at yeah, all I'm not, I'm not gonna you know kind of um rain on somebody's parade but i'm all about the facts these days <laughs> yeah well i think that's good definitely yeah yeah so in, re in regard to freemasonry so freemasonry as the fraternity as we know it today really emerged pretty early on and during the 18th century obviously there's a prehistory there as well but but um when it went to europe uh, all of these other "Quote unquote Masonic rites sort of sprang up and became extremely popular, such as the strict observance, which claimed to have a Templar origin, and others claimed to uh, uh, maybe have an alchemical origin or whatever it was. And, and you mentioned um, Pasquale with this sort of Christian uh, mysticism, or maybe even Christian occultism, and a kind of semi-Masonic framework. So why?" Uh, how did um, the Egyptian rite fit into that, or uh, or Cagliostro himself? How did he fit into that, or challenge that, or? Um, I think the Cagliostro was probably influenced by Pasquale. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a lot of kind of um, crossovers between uh, the use of the angelic names oh. and um, the, the whole premise with Cagliostro's ritual and with Pasquale's is, you know, the redemption of man after the fall. Yeah. Um, so this sort of massive self-improvement goal within it um, to mm -hmm. become not only just a, you know, a, a better person, but also to become um, divine, yeah. I guess. Which actually is a very kind of, I mean, they're all very sort of narcissistic <laughs> um, things in their own right, if you'll pardon the pun. Yeah. Um, because, you know, harking back to Egypt, you were only allowed to or, um, claim divinity if you were obviously, you know, Pharaoh or right. Or one of the um even the high priest kind of didn't go that far they were an intermediary but they certainly yeah. weren't on the same level and i i think where these rites came in is it it made gave an extra level of specialness um yeah. to the people you know i mean good grief i mean freemasonry and any form of esotericism um or uh ancient tradition are amazingly exciting in their own right and mm. it's almost like they wanted to make special even more special yeah yeah <laughs> and if they could if they could harness this specialness for themselves then mm. there was this kind of elite layer of um i'm more esoteric than you or more divine than yeah, you for sure i, I think yeah um, and i'm sure they were beautiful rituals um and I totally applaud the fact that, you know, they, they were trying to make themselves better. Yeah. Um, with, this, I mean, Cagliostro, he, he did have quite a few things that went alongside the ritual. There were these, um, what he called um, his quarantines, uh -huh. whereby you were oh, made to go into the, woods or some kind of special um building he actually had some built where you could go and do these quarantines where you would 
it was a quest basically purging, praying, mm. meditating. Um, but by the end of it, you were meant to kind of like be reborn as, um, you know, practically divine. Um, whether anyone actually did it, I don't know. Mm. Uh, kind of <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, women were privy to this as well because right. his right was one of the rights of adoption. Right, so men and women could both join. So, yeah, yeah, they didn't actually do the rituals together. It oh. was, um, I do believe that the women had a, a much shorter kind of, a bit more flowery one, <sighs> and that his wife, Serafina, yeah. was in charge of that. She was basically the um, grandmistress. And then at the end, the chaps could come in and that they would... There, there are some rumours that there was, um, you know, sort of sexual elements and right. that there was a form of sex magic yeah. occurring, which could well be possible because obviously he was familiar with Swedenborg's rights and also with um, the kind of things that William Blake was purporting. So there, there was a, there yeah. was definitely a sexual, probably polyamorous kind of vibe wow. going on there which you know kind of often goes with that kind of territory um hence the fact that going back to where i started with this guy coming down on a golden globe right. naked, yeah in him and he would have done it um in front of all these uh very sort of uh elite ladies Right. And he really did this or? Well, he's reputed to. Okay. I mean, you can tell. I mean, we, we've, we've got written um, uh, records of him doing all these bizarre things, whether he actually did. I suppose, you know, it was, again, it's sort of like there's probably a little grain of truth in, in most of it. Right. And they were quite decadent. Um, you know, any <laughs> you get any kind of club elite club and there's going to be a little bit of something odd going on in there somewhere i expect um yeah happens all over the place doesn't it uh but uh unfortunately his lovely right which it was very beautiful um got him in a whole heap of trouble mm. um effectively you know when you start mixing politics and religion which is what happened and which of course you're not meant to do really um he was getting entangled with all sorts of stuff to do with um the french revolution um jacobites mm. and was sorely upsetting the catholic church <laughs> and so how, how long did the egyptian right last not that long mm. um i think he he started creating it probably on his trip to London. Right. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, literally, probably no more than I would think about 10 years. 10 years, wow. Well, sure. I mean, I think it did perhaps continue um, within the lodge in Lyon. Okay, yeah. And they do say that, they are still practicing or, or you know there, there is a lodge i don't mm -hmm. know um i've never actually been able to get any confirmation mm. of that i always thought it'd be amazing to do a um an artistic reenactment of yeah, it yeah really yeah cool. um and there are some absolutely gorgeous paintings done by philip de lutherberg yeah that he did especially for the egyptian right there yeah. they are in a gallery in Devon I believe oh, really Devon or Cornwall um and they're beautiful mm. they really are stunning um they're under license so unfortunately um you know can't use them as freely um as it would wish but um no they are very beautiful if anyone wants to look them up um it, the artist was Philip de Lutherberg um I, he has had a huge influence i think on yeah. people 
um mainly because he was just so out there yeah he, he was just not afraid to yeah. stick his head on the parapet and and right. that was his downfall as well yeah um, i don't think he was a particularly nice guy um i think he treated his wife appallingly mm -hmm. um there is some evidence that he used to that he coerced her to um basically have sex with other guys to get money or power yeah or yeah um again it's gray era we don't really know but i i think she was very 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 miserable mm -hmm. um and she was partly um the cause of his downfall really because um she wanted to go back to rome mm. to see be with her family she'd had enough of him by this time she you know i mean she'd literally been dragged around europe right over and over and been arrested been put in the bastille um you know it's kind of it's a lot to do to prop your husband up right certainly not to mention perhaps the the, the being pimped as well yeah. i think she'd literally just had enough um and of course, when she went, when they went back to Rome, the Inquisition went watch him very carefully, and stupidly, he decided to set up his or wanted to set up a lodge with his right there. Mm. The ultimate in arrogance, really, <laughs> um, to do it right under the the nose of the Inquisition. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that was it. Mm. But, yeah, he has had a huge influence on on things for better or worse. Um, yeah. And he will evidently go down in history as one of the most colourful, bombastic um, figures of the, the 18th century, I think. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, and I believe he, uh, he, the Egyptian right was actually an influence on the rights of Memphis and Mizraim later on. But um, is would you say there are any real differences between the Egyptian right and say the right of strict observance and all of these other rights that were floating around during the 18th century? Um, I, I, I guess the amount of kind of esoteric stuff varied mm. between them. um yeah uh obviously the the lure of immortality and um becoming divine was incredibly you know sort of attractive to yeah. them so i think it, it fed into to most of the rights i think somewhere along the line there was always going to be something that said you know we can make you really special <laughs> not just but really 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 special and yeah. what more do people want than to feel that they're part of something unique and um secret which of course has been the whole thing with you know with the outside opinion of freemasonry that somehow you know it's holding mm -hmm. these incredible secrets that aren't to be divulged and well yeah, I mean, we're the secrets are the are the ones that are the most obvious things to do with passwords um, mm. and signs, um, and so really, it's kind of what you make of it, isn't it? Um, yeah, Freemasonry seems to be one of these. It's actually, I think, it's a, a beautiful organisation because it allows people to find something within it that resonates with them right exactly yeah whether that's a good thing or not is, is dependent on the person obviously but um i think the the huge takeaway of it is is actually self-improvement right becoming a, a better more balanced person yeah uh, and just again segueing back to the whole kind of the egyptian connection mm. as she says in inverted commas yeah. um i one thing that i have seen that i would like to point out that is a direct connection 
um, I feel, and I, you know, I need to do some more research into it, but it's connected to a place that I go a lot when I go to, to Luxor. Mm. Um, and it's the village of the artisans um, known as now as Deir el Medina. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, it, it was known as the place of truth. Um, and it was where all the artisans who worked on the, the tombs, the royal tombs and the mortuary temples around Luxor, um, they all lived there. And they were kept as a separate community ah. um, because the work they did was obviously quite, um, well, very specialised yeah. and they had to be um, properly skilled. So to get into the village, you had to prove that you were an artisan. You had to prove that you were um, either a, an apprentice you know, fellow craft or a master mm. of your um, skills. So right. whether they were stonemasons or um, artists who, who were painting the tombs. Yeah. Um, because it also they had access to the royal tombs and all the things that went with it, i.e. Um, deceased pharaohs and all their riches. Yeah. Um, the, the security was massively tight. They had their own police force called the wow. Medje. Um, but I think that is possibly where um, the things to do with passwords and mm. signs and that perhaps came from is mm. that when the, um, the artisans moved on, when the village was eventually closed down, um, they took their their skills, the stonemason skills, um, yeah. swear, and it probably then they travelled across um, through the Mediterranean to Europe, mm -hmm. and, and hence became the the skilled artisans that we saw within the medieval times. Right, uh, all that knowledge passed down, passed down, passed down, and I think my theory is that that is perhaps where the the passwords and um various other things came about within mm -hmm. the stone mason skills and that right. then translated through to freemasonry yeah yeah um and there are obviously little bits that cross over um from the symbolisms to do with the um, the rituals and ceremonies mm -hmm. um in egypt ancient egypt they used to have um foundation deposit ceremonies whereby they would bury things under the corners of the temples or yeah. buildings that they're erecting so again mm. you've got all these lovely little bits that have been kind of brought over yeah um, and brought into different traditions and i i just think that nothing that we have nowadays is it is anyway 100 percent um you know, part of what was going on then, but no, we've said no. little tiny little bits, which is fascinating because when you sort of unpick the tapestry, you've got all these sort of fabulous golden threads of history. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so perhaps uh, just to wrap up, you could just tell everybody how they can find out more about your books or your work or what you're doing next. Um, yeah, well, my books you can find on amazon and anywhere else where yeah. they sell books <laughs> yeah okay. um i i currently uh, i'm editor of the square magazine um which is the free online magazine for freemasons worldwide um which is is going really well we took over Great. from the original print copy yeah, yeah. um and um it, it's it's growing Oh, day great. by day, which is fantastic, and it's so good to be able to um, have some incredible contributors and yeah. be able to share knowledge with all Freemasons of any jurisdiction, any obedience. We don't have any; um, we're, we're not held back by anything, so we can talk to 
female Freemasons, we can talk to co-Masons, we can, you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're very inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, obviously, that, that takes up the, the bulk of my my work, and I, I do write articles for, for that. Um, yeah. I'm also currently writing a book um, on ancient Egypt uh, to do with the God's Wives of Amun, who were some of the most powerful women in Egypt between the um, 18th and 26th dynasties. And they were uh, religiously and politically motivated, but mm. they held power almost equivalent to Pharaoh. Oh. Fascinating. Yeah. Very, very interesting subject. So um, that should be out late next year i would think depending on a lot of publishing schedules are a bit sure at the moment um yeah and hopefully that will happen i'm off to egypt fingers crossed in a week or so Great. and um do a bit more research get some photos and we'll probably do a few bits of filming to um pique people's interest in the god's wives while yeah. i'm out there Fantastic. Great. Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much for um, listening to me <laughs> waffle on about. Oh, Iraq. no. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're very welcome.